One of the byproducts of the emergence of craft unionism was a desire to get some public recognition for the new importance of the working man in, in Canadian life, locally, regionally, nationally. And so starting in the early 1880s, you find uh, groups of, of organized workers approaching city councils and saying, we want to have a, a celebration of labor, a labor festival on some day this summer, and please, we want to shut down the town. And invariably, they got the right to do it. Eventually, they approached the federal government to say, oh, we want this to be a national holiday. And it took the government quite a while to agree, but in 1894, Labor Day was created as a uh, national holiday on the first, the first Monday in September. The only holiday ever created around one social group that had made such a demand. And workers then um, felt they had the opportunity but also the requirement to put on a good show to make it clear that this was going to be um, a celebration of labor. <clears throat> so the Labor Day Parade was born. It had long roots going back into the, in the 19th and even further back in, some, in the case of some crafts. But they <clears throat> made a, a great effort to, to present themselves in their, in their best clothing or even in special costumes that would highlight what their, their um, particular occupational group did. Um, and to parade together under beautiful banners and to, to pull along uh, some floats that had uh, products that they made or quite often little reproductions of the, the work being done so that someone following along might get biscuits tossed out to them or uh, a metal coin because they sometimes have little foundries on the back. In one case I discovered that they <clears throat> that the uh, the local brewery was handing out samples up the back of his truck as, as he brewed it on the back but that was not very common because it was too controversial. But they basically put on display their craft, and, and uh, their whole point was not just to entertain, but to make a great public statement, because a parade was a form of communication, a way of letting people know something. Um, and their communication was, we are important, we make very important products, we are respectable, and you should treat us properly. And we are very well organized, look at all of us, look how many of us there are. And the point would be to, to get all of the brothers and to, to come out into, into the line to, to participate. Now, in the early days, <clears throat> that rarely, if ever, included any women, because this was a man's world. It rarely, if ever, included any of the child laborers, because they were not part of the unionized world. If there were children, they were just baubles on floats in one way or another. It almost never included people of color, because they, unless they were used as clowns in some form. Uh, or Aboriginal people for, for the same reason. Um, so it was, a, it was a white man's parade, um, white working man's parade, which reflected the, the racial and ethnic differences that existed within the working class, but also the gendered differences, where this was a celebration of manhood that took for granted that womenhood should be in the home, should be domestic. Um, <clears throat> and when they did bring women into the, into the parade, it would be <clears throat> the ones who were young and single, because most working women who worked for wages were unmarried, um, <clears throat> who worked, say, in the textile mill, and who were not allowed to march in the street with the boys, but were put in wagons, and they'd have on their best, best uh, frocks and, and little parasols to make them look that much more fragile and petite and under the protection of the boys. Uh, and, and in this way, they made a, a significant impact on local communities. Thousands of people came out to watch these parades. And for, in, into the early 20th century, it was still a major community event. As craft unionism begins to suffer in the age of the second industrial revolution, the parades be, lose their, their vitality. And through many, many cities, they're canceled and, and only come back later in the 20th century when new groups of workers organize and revitalize the tradition in different forms. Like in the 1930, 1930s and 40s, there's a uh, an effort for the, for the new industrial unions to create their own tradition of parading, which would continue on for a couple of decades after that. But the other reason that they failed was that they were getting challenged by an important different tradition that was coming out of the left. The left looked at these parades and said, you filled up these events with commercial uh, activities. All you're doing is giving Eaton's and Simpson's a chance to put their, their bread, their uh, their delivery wagons in the parade and, and every local carter who has a, a, a 
a wagon or a truck is going to be included, and that's no way to run a, a proper parade. What you need is a class-conscious festival. And the left, therefore, turned to May Day as an alternative. And it was uh, late in Canada, it was relatively late uh, starting up as a, as a celebration. It would happen first in Montreal in, in 1906, 1907, and the, the years following. And gradually, Western Canada began to, absor to accept that as their alternative. Labor Day completely died out in Western Canada, but May Day became a tradition that came and went as an alternative. One that was far less popular with lo the local business community, which liked to have Labor Day as a kind of community booster event, and May Day was much more of a class conscious event that, that uh, shook things up. But what that reflected, of course, was that the labor movement uh, was dividing between those who, th who thought that the goal was to have a sort of moderate, cautious, respectable labor movement that's a, a set of unions that sat down and signed contracts with bosses, and particularly the craft unionists believed this in the early, 20, early uh, years of the 20th century. But they were being challenged increasingly by radicals who said, that shuts out large numbers of workers who don't fit that model, and it's, it's a way of pulling your teeth in, in terms of whether you're going to get anything from employers as an approach to, to, uh, to getting wage earners' demands. So a more radical industrial form of unionism began to emerge in different parts of the country and in different industries that uh, were usually read, led by radicals, but n not exclusively. Uh, and they tried to, to unite workers as, as members of a working class rather than as just members of a, a particular occupational group. And we find that the most f famous and um, colorful example was the Industrial Workers of the World, which was founded in 1905 in Chicago and quickly has Canadian counterparts in Western Canada, <clears throat> which leads uh, some resource industry workers and construction workers in some major strikes. But it's, it's also true of mining, uh, mining unions in Nova Scotia and Western Canada that turn not to the IWW but to a much more militant kind of, of unionism that's more dedicated to uniting everyone and standing up to the bosses, mostly defeated uh, in the era up to the First World War. And by the end of the First World War, you have a period in which pulling workers together in whatever way possible becomes the name of the game. Every community across the country is is inspired by the by the democratic rhetoric of the war and the possibilities that that having jobs that everyone's had have have given them, and so we find in, in both much more industrial militancy, but also a lot more radical ideas about how to organize workers, just burbling up everywhere. And part of that being, of course, the Winnipeg General Strike. But there are. Uh, and the most famous example, but there were uh, there was a general strike in Toronto. There was an attempt to get one in Winnipeg. There was one in Amherst, Nova Scotia, which was actually successful, um, and many other efforts to draw workers together uh, in in defiance of the ways in which the old breaking them up into bits and pieces had uh, had uh, kept been going on before. Unfortunately, the, the the established pattern by this point was to rise up, resist confront and get, no, get nothing but resistance from employers and to get, end up in defeat because there was very little sympathy for, for, for this kind of uh, new political development from the government. And so generally I find myself telling students that before the Second World War, Canada was a largely ununionized country. Uh, that there were episodes in which workers were able to, for periods, short periods of time, to put together some kind of uh, project of, of organizing that had limited or grand ambitions, but they were almost always defeated or marginalized. And that's uh, a, the, story, the story that distinguishes us, uh, certainly from Western Europe and especially Britain. Uh, does, it's very similar to the United States in, it, it, in the sense that uh, there wasn't much serious successful organizing until the end of the 19th, middle of the end of the 1930s in, in the United States. Um, in Canada, it really waits till the Second World War.